hardest things for me to do is to calm the fellowship down. I love listening to that fellowship. Love it. We're in Revelation chapter 18. We're just almost through. 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Five more chapters. Shouldn't take us more than about nine months. At my rate, yeah. Chapter 18. Okay, last week, in chapter 17, it was the very end of the pouring out of the bowls of wrath. We saw all those things that, all those people that was benefited by Rome, they also were suffering because all of a sudden now, where they were getting their money now was taken from them. Now, here we are. You associate with evil and you will pay the price as well. I believe that's what you're trying to get us to understand there. But here he is bringing down not only Rome, but all of their puppet kings, all of their spying nations, all of those folks. Look how 18 begins. The holy city, the city, Babylon, has what? has fallen. Folks, I think it's kind of interesting. But what we see here is kind of a fulfillment back under chapter 6 and verse 10. I'm seeing some of you turn back there right now. So what is 610? All right, do you remember the souls under the altar? And what were those souls of the altar crying for? Vindication. Well, God said, I will at my time, right? I will at my time. They'll pay the price. Well, folks, they're in the process of paying the price. God kept us keeping his promise right here. I've had people say, now, wait a minute, could it mean, yes, it could, but not being consistent with chapter 1 and verse 3. <laughs> I keep going back, you know, how many times have we done, done that? Chapter 1 and verse 3, all of this must shortly come to pass. You've heard that so many times, you can almost quote it, can't you? All of this, now, folks, how in the world is the, is this going to help those first century Christians if it talks about something in the 24th century? Or something in the 23rd century? Or the 9th century? It's not. They're looking for help right now because they're suffering. But can you make application out of it? Sure. Sure, you can. I made this illustration a couple of three or four times. 1 Corinthians talks about the problems in the church in Corinth. Oh, they have problems. Any different than today? The exact same problems that Corinth was having, we're having right now. Now, it wasn't written to us, but can the same applications be applied? Sure. Sin is sin. And if it's something similar back there and they dealt with it, can we make the same applications? Sure. Well, here we are in the book of Revelation. It was help those people in the first century through their, their persecution and their problems. But if we're going through something similar today, can we say, yeah, the same thing is good for us? Yeah. But that, but that was the purpose of the book? No. The purpose of the book was to help them but it also helps us. One of the greatest passages in the whole book, and you've heard me say this in a few hundred times, chapter 2 and verse 10, 
be faithful until death, even if it requires your life, be ye faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life? No, the crown of life. Ye be faithful all your days, and heaven is yours. Is the same promise for us today? Yes. All right, now here we are in chapter 18. But before we get into it, let's see if God will help us. Good, please. Thank you, Father. Thank you for bringing this together. Thank you for helping us to understand the, the power and the truth of your word. But also help us, Father, to see that, that you are working. And you are helping us day by day. And by looking at the way that he dealt with Rome and the problems that he presented to the church back in the first century, we're so thankful, Father, that we have that have that example before us where we can find the same security and the same hope and the same trust and the same promises. Be with us as we look at, at these final few chapters. I mean, we understand that truly you are in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 18. Heaven is in control. That's the whole message of chapter 18. If I had to put it in a sentence, there it is. But he goes a roundabout way to proving it. But here we go. After these things, after what things? Chapter 1 through 17. After these things, I saw another angel. How many is this now? Probably a 10 or 12 of them. I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Now listen to this one. Having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory. Where has he been? He's been right in the very presence of God. Do you remember when Moses was at the burning bush? Even after he was away from the burning bush, and the burning bush, he was in the presence of God. And what did he do as long, you know, for, for some time until he's long enough away from the bush that he lost this? But what happened? He glowed with the power of God, you know, the glory of God. What, this angel, what was he doing? He was glowing with the glory of God. But this one had a little bit more than all the other angels. Most of them were just messengers. But this is, he is too. But I want to show you something. This one has great authority. He's coming down with a rolled up fist kind of a situation. And he's been right here in the very presence of God. And he cried out with a mighty voice. I tell you what, when you hear him, sometimes we can be here and you can hear the thunder way off over here. But then sometimes the crack of lightning and the thunder is almost instantaneous. And the hair on your head sticks out and the hair on your arm sticks out because, whoa, that was close. And your ears ring for 10 minutes because of that boom, right? You've been there. That's kind of the impression I'm getting here. Not, he didn't just say, I have a message for you. He boomed it out. I have a message for you. And look what that message is. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. All right. 17, the very last verse. Who is Babylon? The great city. During the first century, what was the great city? Rome. Was Babylon the greatest city of its time? Oh, by far. You know, it was a wonderful place, you know, to look at. Oh, filthy, ungodly, 
as you can be, but so was Rome. Anybody ever been, been to Rome? I've been fortunate to go to Rome. Folks, it's, it's a marvelous town. It's, a, it's, it, it's amazing to see their first century architecture. You go, wow, how, how those guys were so smart. But they were. It's fantastic. And you go, yeah, I can understand why they lasted for that many years. But he said, hey, I don't care how powerful, how beautiful, how organized it is, it's fallen. What was the promise? Did, did God keep his promise to the souls under the altar? Yep. Yep, he did. And now, he starts describing all the things that's going to happen to her and her puppet kings and her maritime partners, and those people who made millions and millions of dollars off of her extravagance, talking about Rome, right? You remember how they described her last time? As a queen, she had all that, uh, you know, the, the arraignment, the jewelry, the place of honor, and it described her perfectly as a queen but she was anything but good. She had one purpose, to commit immorality with the world. Did she do it? Yeah. Did Babylon do it? Yeah. Did Assyria do it? Yeah. When they had control, they took advantage of it. Has the United States done it? Are they doing it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not only the immorality, but the worldliness and the filth that our country is turning into. And I hate it. I see a sign out here just outside town. If you're not proud to be an American, then leave. Well, that's true. But I tell you what, where would I go? The whole world's filthy. I do. I know where I go. I'm going to find me an island out in the middle of nowhere. But then how am I going to pay for it? I, I'll, I'll get China to pay for it for me. They bought everything else. But here we go. He said, Babylon has fallen. And she has become the dwelling place of Demons? All evil creatures? Now, we know that during this time it's an evil spirit, right? During this time. Talking about biblical time. All of a sudden now I'm seeing all kinds of little monsters running around tonight. Demons? You know, you know what I'm talking about for Halloween. But look right here. This is filled with all kinds of filth and uncleanness. She has become the dwelling place of demons and a prison for every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. Everything that's hated, scavengers of all kinds, now they can't leave Rome. God placed them there and they're there. You want to be in Rome now? No. No. For all the nations. Remember what when we saw the queen? What did she have in her hand? The goblet. And what was in that goblet? Blood. Blood of whom? saints. And what did, what did that blood of the saints do to her and her puppet kings? Intoxicated them where they wanted more and more and more. Remember? Now look. For all the nations had drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality. All of the nations that 
she had control of were just as filthy as she was. You know what? Isn't it amazing? How the big dog on the park, the big the big guy on, at school, is usually the one that dominates things. Rome dominated things, and everybody wanted to be just like Rome. And were they making it? Yes. And now tell me something. What's going to happen to all these things that wanted to be just like Rome? They're going to have the exact same consequences. Here we go. Oh, my word, it's a... This is not looking good. But here we go. For the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her, the New American says, sensuality. What's another word? Luxury, so what's that? Luxurious living. In other words, they expected the very best. And what they, if Rome was willing to pay the price, what were these merchants going to do? Get them the very best. If I had the money to buy a Mercedes, I wasn't going to buy 10 Hugo's. Do you understand what I just said? I'm going to buy that Mercedes. Even though it may not be the best car on the road, but that's the reputation it has, right? But here it goes. These guys, they were getting rich because of her desire to be the best. But is she the best? Maybe during that day, she had the illusion of being the best, but who's the only one that's good? Hmm. She said, God. And I go, hmm. Somewhere down through there, she, she lost the boat, didn't she? Uh, you remember where it happened? But do you remember where Rome started going down when they started putting in emperors who considered themselves God? Now, what happens when we, as men, start thinking we are gods? It won't be long until the true God of heaven is going to prove to you you are wrong. Yeah, we're yeah you're yeah yeah we're just as smart as it gets. Yeah, yeah that won't take long to prove. Brad Harrod was here just a couple weeks ago, or about a week ago. You know what Brad proved to me? I'm stupid. That guy is smart. But then again, whew, if I'd done that thing 40 times every year as he does, I'd know it too, wouldn't I? But here we go here. These people, the merchants of the earth, have become rich because of her desire for the best. Okay. Now look at verse 4. And I heard another voice. Uh-oh. But we didn't see an angel this time. We heard a voice from where? From heaven saying, usually, what's that implying? Who's speaking? God the Father. That's usually what that implies. Tell me if this could apply here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. What's the next phrase? My people. So this is a voice from God. He's calling them out of the filth of the world. Uh, which one of you has he not done that for? Has he called us? What does he call us with? The gospel. And he's going to take us out of the darkness of sin and corruption and put us into the marvelous light of his son's kingdom. He's making the same promise right here. Look, here we go. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, 
that you may not participate in her sins, that you may not receive her plagues. Wow. Wow. The things that she's fixing to suffer, get out of town. Because it's fixing to be a hot time tonight in Rome, right? Get out of town. All right, here's verse 5. For her sins have piled up how high? All the way to heaven. Tell me something. Has there been a sin that Rome hasn't committed? Doesn't sound like it. Is God totally aware of what they've done? Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting. Where I was raised in eastern New Mexico, it was a dry county. In other words, you couldn't go down and buy you a bottle to drink of any kind. So there's a lot of bootleggers, you know, steals, that type of stuff. I think it was kind of interesting. Some of these guys who had to have it, they would go and buy the booze and put it in a brown plastic, a brown bag, you know, those paper bags, and walk around like everybody in town didn't know what was in the bottle, right? Then they would go back in the, in the very print behind the building somewhere and they would tilt that thing straight up and look straight to God committing that sin. Rome had, had done that for hundreds of years and God said, I can tell you every one of them that you did. All right. Chapters 2 and 3 when he's talking about the seven churches of Asia, every time, what was the first thing he said about them? I know your works. I know what you've done. Both good and bad. And by the way, I don't care if you do 2,000 good and only one bad, that one bad is going to outbalance those 2,000 good unless that one bad has been covered by the blood of Jesus, right? Here we go. It's piled up as high as heaven, verse 5. And God has remembered her as Rome's iniquities. Now, why is he, what has God promised you about your iniquities? You become a Christian, and he will... Forgive you your iniquities, but then he will remember them no more. Not only will he forgive you, but he'll forget about them. Uh, that's Jeremiah 31 and verse 34 promised. Wow. You mean all those things that I did back when I was stupid and young? And God says, what are you talking about? When I'm looking at you, I'm looking at the blood of Jesus. I'm seeing something that's worthy. Isn't that exciting? He sees you as clean and free and without your sins because you know what? He remembers Rome's and he doesn't remember yours. If you have given, you know, if you have obeyed the gospel, right? Say again. True. She just made a perfect statement right here. If Rome, and he gave her opportunity after opportunity to repent. If Rome had ever repented, what happened to her, her iniquities? They'd been gone, and God wouldn't remember them. But I, have no, I don't know how many times in the book he said, and they did not repent. Probably half a dozen times or more. Now, every time he gave them a warning, an earthquake or a, a thunder or something, what was that? An opportunity for them to say, whoops, I've loved up somewhere and repent. But they refused to repent. And just a couple of chapters earlier, it said that. And they repented not.
Yeah. Good point. And if we don't take them as warnings, we're going to receive the same promise that Romans got. But look, look at verse 6. I can see God, you know, I, I goof around a lot, and I, I say, oh, I don't get even, I get better. Do you understand what I meant by that? Now, hey, you gave me a hard time, expect it back worse, you know? But look what he's going to do right here in verse 6. Pay her back even as she has paid, but, it, it's not the, the, uh, the conjunction, and instead of paying her back even, what's he going to do? He's going to look and give back to her double according to her deeds. Yikes. Not only will she pay back, but she'll pay back twice. So all the millions of dollars that she stole, all the men's lives that she stole, all of the, you know, all the sin people that she brought upon people and sucked them in through her, their immorality, she's going to be paying now horribly. Okay. According to her deeds, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. She's carrying around the sins of the you no, know, the sins of the blood, right? Make her pay twice. I don't think I want to be in Rome, do you? I don't think I want to be in Rome. It doesn't sound like a pretty picture. All right. If that's the God's attitude in the first century, has it changed in the 21st century? No. But do you and I have a choice? Can we heed the warnings? Uh, let me rephrase it. Must we heed the warnings? Yes. Folks, our world has been given opportunity to repent, to repent, to repent. And we as stupid Romans refuse to. We'll pay the, you know, one day our country will pay the price, won't we? But here we, but be ye faithful unto death. Be ye faithful. There's the key word, unto death. And then, Uh-huh. Yeah. Excellent. Ex For those of you at home, you need to hear that remark. Throughout time, Israel has always had conquerors. But in each one, there is always a faithful remnant. Was there a faithful remnant in Romans' day? Yes. Is the church still strong because of their example? Well, not as strong as I want it to be, but yes. Is the church still in existence? Yes. If so, I thought it was kind of interesting. When we looked at those seven churches of Asia, he made one promise to them. This congregation's doomed. This congregation, I'm coming and I'm going to take its candlestick. But there are faithful people still in that congregation. They still have their candlestick. I don't care how ungodly we may you know that our country may become. You got a candlestick, hold on to it. Right? Is that what, kind of what you're alluding to? Uh, 
Rome is bad. It's not a place you want to be. But there are faithful people there. Get it? Uh, and and you look around in our world today, and you'll say, "Oh, we have such a beautiful, beautiful country." You had the church of your choice on top of every hill. But the problem is, the church of my choice may not be the church of God's choice. Which church did Jesus build? His church we need to remember that and did he give us the, the the building plan for that yeah can you and I duplicate it yeah we better duplicate it or we're going to have a man-made religion that will will doom us as well that's sad the only way we're going to make it to heaven if we do it God's way and not man's way right what did Rome do they made it man's way. No, they made it the emperor's way for a long time. And Rome was filthy rich because of it. But look, look, verse 7. To the degree that she glorified herself. Oh, you got to be kidding. You know, time. Boy, that. 40 minutes goes by in a hurry, doesn't it? But here he goes. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree gave her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and not as a widow and will never see mourning. Uh-oh. Her arrogance just is going to be slapping her on the side of the head, isn't it? Her arrogance here. Did Rome, did Rome know that she was the most powerful nation on the earth at that time? Yes. And could Rome back up her threats? Yes. And she knew it. Hmm. And what did God just promise? I'm gonna pay her back big time. Now, can you hear can you hear these souls on the altar going, Yes? But they may have relatives alive. And if Rome comes down, what's gonna to happen to those Christians who are alive during that time? Are they gonna suffer as well? Yeah. But the thing is, they have hope, she said. They have hope. Where every one of us is going to experience death in this body if Jesus doesn't come back first, right? We're going, we have that appointment for us. So, I'm just thankful this is not, not going to go to heaven. Whew! I'd hate this stuff in eternity at this. But here we go. The part of me that God blew life into made, they turned me into an eternal being just like, just like Adam. The part of me is going to live forever, either in heaven or in hell. And the most, the most comforting part is, I get to choose where I go. Isn't that nice? I get to choose. I can obey God, or I can obey the world. It's just that simple. And so when, when you hear somebody say, you mean... You, you gave in to that? No, I obeyed that. God wants a commitment. And Rome refused to give it. Who was Rome committed to? Rome herself. Herself. To the degree that she glorified 
herself. Has the United States done that? Has China done that? What country hasn't done that? Wow. For this reason, how quick is all this going to take place? For this reason, in one day, uh, how long did it take God to create this? One day. How long is it going to take God to get rid of it? One day. But in one day, her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her. It says it's strong. That's not, I wish he had hadn't said that. Is in control. I like that better. That's not what it says. It's is strong. He is mighty and strong and a lot stronger than Rome. But in, look, look what he's going to bring down on her. Pestilence and mourning and famine. Uh, is that basically the same thing that he brought down on Egypt? Hmm. And what were those opportunities for Egypt to do? Repent. And they tried twice, but God said, huh, I'm not through. Remember? He hardened the heart of Pharaoh because, hey, those plagues were not for Pharaoh. Those plagues were for the Israelites to show that God was in control. Hey, that's what he's trying to get us to understand here. I'm in control and I don't care how powerful the nation is against me. I am stronger. I've heard it said many a time, when you walk with God, you and God are a majority. Because God's in control. You do God's will and you are in the majority. Even though you may be greatly outnumbered over there Armageddon. God's going to win. I was waiting for that battle. But it says, but the, king, but the saints overcame. Wait a minute. But you know what the best part about that is? We win. We win. But here he goes. For in one day, her plagues will come because God is strong. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of a more immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the, the smoke of her, of her burning. Why would they lament and weep? Dan did it this way. Their money all of a sudden is gone. Because, hey, Rome, they were taking care of Rome's <clears throat> quest for wealth. Fine. I can give you all that gold and silver and, and, and precious jewels and fine attire. I can do it. It's going to cost you, but I can do it. And these guys got filthy rich, and all of a sudden, their source of income is gone. Okay? Now, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, Babylon, the strong city. For in one hour, your judgment is come. Uh-oh. Rome, you're not as tough as you thought you were. God will win. That's about the whole message here of chapter 18. The merchants of verse 11 and 12, all these things that they were peddling, they were crying out, Where's all of our customers gone? They're gone. All the way down through verse, um, really down through verse 22, 20. But he's talking about all the things that they bought and sold right down to humans. Not only did they have a, a trade for, for slaves, but they had a a great national thrill of gladiator war of fighting. 
where men actually died. And look at all these things that they described through there, the, the, what they ate and what they had and all those. And verse 16 says, Whoa, whoa, the great city she was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious jewels and, and pearls. For one, in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor, as many as them who were living by the sea, stood at a distance and were crying out, and they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? We can't find a substitute for this. And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning and saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city in which all who had ships of sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she had been laid waste. And then here came the voice from heaven. I don't, it doesn't say that, but it does. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints and apostles and prophets, <coughs> excuse me, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. All right, I heard your prayers under the altar. Done. Now, will there be prayers under the altar for the demise of the United States? Probably. China? Probably. The Nazis, most definitely. Every country in the world one day will stand before God. Every person, even in here, every person will stand before God. And how long is it going to take for him to judge those billions and billions of people? Twinkling of an eye. Oh, but you get to appeal to the Supreme Court, right? Uh, no, there is no Supreme Court when God's the judge. But I like my chances. You know why? I'm washing the blood of Jesus. He's going to be my lawyer. And who is my judge? Him using the word that I obeyed. Do you like your chances? I like my chances. Did Rome have the same opportunity? Do you have the same opportunity? And if you don't do it, who's the only person you can blame? If you don't go to heaven, who's the only person you can point your finger at? Yourself. Well, we're not through yet, but we're going to start with verse 19. No, uh, start with verse 21 next week. Wow. Wow. Sad chapter, huh? But not. What did that chapter show? God is in charge. I wish the world catches on to that, don't you? Okay. Any any comments? Good stuff, huh? Good stuff. Okay. All right, we'll see you next week. Ah.